I'd like to call to order the November 10th meeting of the Clive City Council. Would the clerk please call roll? Mayor Edwards? Here. Council members Klein? Here. McCoy? Here. Judkins? Here. Weaver? Here. McElhinney? Here. Everyone is here. Would you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, we have the agenda. I know of no additions or changes. To approval. Second. Your motion and second to approve the agenda. Further discussion? Seeing none, will all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like, sign. The agenda is approved. Next on the agenda, we have citizen presentation. This is the opportunity for a citizen to approach the council on an item that is not on the agenda. And Pete, do we have anyone online tonight? No, Your Honor. We'll move on to consent. Requires a resolution. Move approval. Second. The motion and a second to approve the consent. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And will the clerk please post that? Vote? Matthew, I'm an eye on that. I'm having problems logging in. Hey, Richard, you shut up. So that uh, consent is approved by a vote of five to zero. We'll now move into our action items, beginning with public hearing. Did we uh, publish the appropriate public notice? Yes, Your Honor. A public hearing notice was published in the Des Moines Register on October 20th, 2022. Very good. Uh, Jeff. Mayor Council, evening. Uh, have for us the Bids for the 2022-2023 sanitary sewer lining project. We received four bids, uh, a little bit higher than expected, um, but grouped together pretty tight. We talked to one of the bidders right before we went out uh, for approval or went out for bids, gave us some numbers. We upped those a little bit and they came even a little bit higher, but uh, with, with a grouping uh, of the lower three bids, it looks like they're very competitive. Uh, we've worked with HydroClean before um, and recommend awarding to HydroClean. Any questions for Jeff? If not- Move to close public hearing. The motion, is there a second? Second. Motion and second to close public hearing. Before we do, is there anyone in the chamber or online who wishes to address the council on this matter? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And, and would the clerk please post that vote? I'm an eye on that. So the motion to close the public hearing Passes by a vote of five to zero. First item is a resolution approving plans and specs. Move the resolution. Second. The motion is second to approve the plans and specs. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? Aye. And will the clerk please post that vote? That resolution passes by a vote of five to zero. Move the receipt of bids. Second. We have a motion and a second to receive the bids. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? And will the clerk please post that vote? Bids are received with approval by a vote of five to zero. With the resolution awarding the contract to HydroClean for $215,429.50. Second. Motion is second to award the contract to HydroClean. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? All right. And that passes by a vote of five to zero. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Audit, Liz. Good evening, Mayor and Council. For tonight, we have your uh, request for approval um, for the annual financial um, audit report. So this is the third year that we've used I Bailey. Um, Brad and his team have been incredible to work for, great resource throughout the year. Um, we've had some different situations come up, and so it's been really great to brainstorm and um, make sure that we're uh, following best practices. Um, our process went really well, so um, with that, I wanted to introduce Brad Tyson from I Bailey. He'll be giving you a summary of the report. Good evening, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Good. Great. Okay. Uh, as Liz said, I'm... I'm Brad Tyson with Ide Bailey. I'm a senior manager. 
Um, I've been, you know, working on the city of, of Clive's Audit here for three years now. Um, in the past, I've just kind of gone over a high level overview of the financial statements. And I think that's what I'll do tonight too. Um, and if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free just to stop me as I go through. So um, the financial statements, which I believe you have in your packet, um, the, our opinion on the financial statements start on page two. Um, and you'll notice a little bit of the changes in the opinion this year. Um, some of the paragraphs were sort of flip-flopped around. Um, those changes were prescribed by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Um, and it basically gets uh, more to the point right away. Um, so you can tell right in the first couple paragraphs, it talks about the type of opinion that we issue on the finance statements of the city. Um, and it is an unmodified or clean opinion on the finance statements. So uh, basically what it's saying is anything um, that's presented within the document, you know, we have a, an unmodified opinion or we believe it's presented fairly and accurately. Um, as you move on further down our opinion, um, it does a good job also of spelling out the responsibilities of the different entities. Um, so the city is responsible for uh, the presentation um, or the fairness and preparation and presentation of the financial statements. Um, we are responsible for providing an opinion on those financial statements under two different um, standard setters. Um, one is the is generally accepted auditing standards through the AICPA. Um, the other is government auditing standards, which is controlled by the federal government. Um, and there's a little bit of a difference between the two, and I'll get into those later on um, in the financial statements here. So um, the, the next thing I'll go to is management's discussion and analysis, which starts on page six and goes through page 12. And basically, you know, I know this is a, a pretty big document overall. Um, it, it's tough to read the whole thing, but if there's one thing you were going to read, I would I would recommend reading through the management's discussion and analysis. It's basically um, sort of management's words of you know what the year over year changes are um, from a governmental activity standpoint, from a fund level standpoint, um, from a, you know, a fund balance and a long term debt perspective as well too. Um, so it, it does a great job of sort of comparing 2021 to 2022 um, and, and identifying what the differences were for, for this fiscal year. Um, as you get to pages 13 through 17, those are the basic financial statements. Um, and that's some more information um, basically about the governmental activities and business type activities sort of aggregated together. Um, and then there's also fund level information there too for like the general fund and all of your special revenue funds as well too. So segregated in a little bit more detail behind that. Um, the notes to the financial statements are after that, and those go up on pages 18 through 41, and they provide information, um, a little more information than was provided previously on long-term debt of the entity uh, transfers between different funds. Um, they provide some information on the pension obligations of the city, as well as some jointly governed organizations um, and that type of information as well. Um, and then as you move further on into the report, uh, there's some other information um, that's provided. Uh, probably the biggest one you'd, you'd want to be aware of is the budget versus actual report, which is presented on page 42. Um, that's usually one you know, that, that gets a lot of um, a looks um, as you go through. Um, so, and then there's also some pension schedules in there that are, provide more of a historical um, analysis of, of the pension information over the past 10 years too. Um, as you move towards the back of the report, um, this was probably, when you get back to pages 53 and 54, um, this is kind of where the difference comes in between just generally accepted auditing standards and governmental auditing standards. So one of the keys to the differences between those two is anytime you have a, an audit under governmental auditing standards, um, there has to be uh, a report that's presented that provides information about internal control deficiencies of the entity um, and it has to re be publicly available. Um, so on pages 53 and 54, it sort of defines the different types of internal control deficiencies. Um, you have internal control deficiencies sort of on a, a lower level. Um, as you move up to more serious ones, it goes to significant deficiencies. Um, and it also defines what a material weakness is too, which is kind of like the highest level of internal control deficiency. Um, the good news with that is as you go on to pages 55 and 56, it kind of talks about whether or not the city had any of those. Um, and as we have presented in the past, um, at the top of page 55, the first kind of bullet point there talks about there were no findings to report 
uh, for the city for fiscal year 22. So no significant deficiencies and no material weaknesses were recognized as part of our audit process um, in reviewing the city's work papers and, and financial statements. Um, so then as you go through the rest of the schedule of findings and, and responses, there's also some information there that's required by the state um, auditor of Iowa. Uh, they kind of make us go through certain compliance items that they consider to be hot button issues, um, you know, like your budget, uh, any sort of travel expenses or uh, TIF obligations, and just report on any sort of inconsistencies that we might find there. So there are two items there. I think one was very, very minor, um, and there's sort of obligation, sort of um, items that were required to report without sort of any materiality limit. Um, so I think in one case we found a, a travel expense reimbursement that was. Um, that was reimbursed at a rate of two cents higher than it should have been. Um, so obviously immaterial, but something that we have to put in the report as well too. Um, and then there's also uh, some information about related party information there too. Both of those that are presented are below what the state considers to be sort of the statutory limit for related party transactions. Um, but we still have to present those within the financial report too. So. Um, so that's pretty much the schedule findings and responses as well as the financial statements. Um, I guess I'd, I'd just like to say thanks to Elizabeth and her staff. Um, they've been great to work with and definitely made uh, the transition um, from Joyce to Elizabeth this year very easy to to, um, to negotiate throughout the year. So um, with that, I think that's all I have to present. Unless um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to let me know. Questions for Brad. Brad, do you have anything on a from a watch basis, typical on these audience uh, audits? There could be something that might show concern. Is there anything that would you consider a watch? No, um, not that I can think of. No, so I mean, it, so again, kind of going back to the schedule findings and, and responses, we would, if we felt there was something, um, it, actually, that's the definition of a significant deficiency, which is one of the internal control items that we, we need to report on, is if we thought there was something. Um, that the city council would want to be aware of, um, we would have to report it in this report. And, and we did not find anything that we thought um, sort of required any sort of reporting or anything really of that for that matter. Thank you. Any other questions for Brad or Liz? It looks like a great audit and uh, I'd suggest we uh, approve the resolution. Great job, Liz. <clears throat> uh, I'll move approval. Second. Motion second to approve the audit. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? If I could add, Your Honor, this, you know, during a transition, it is a challenging time in terms of interpreting between two different finance officers. And, and Liz and Corey did a great job and worked really hard to get this where it is. And, and credit to Brad and his team, too, for working through a number of items where we had to figure some things out. And as you can see, the end result is we're, we're very happy with and uh, a great foundation for us going forward. Great work. Can we post the vote? It passes by a vote of five to zero. And I'd Thank say you, that, Brad. Uh, that also reflects well on Joyce and how she left things. Right? Yep. Very good. Richard. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thanks. Tonight before you is the first reading of proposed ordinance changes uh, regarding combining the Parks and Recreation Board with the Public Art Commission. This is something that was talked about as strategic planning. It's also been discussed by both the Public Art Commission as well as the Parks and Recreation Board and um, feel comfortable with the synergy that putting those two together into one Parks, Recreation and Public Art Board will create um, with all the public art and parks projects that we're doing here in the next five to six years. Um, the proposed changes are to uh, combine it. It would be a monthly meeting um, uh, with kind of on the same schedule as the Parks and Recreation Board. Of the seven Parks and Recreation Board members, five are interested in continuing on on this new board. And of the five Public Art Commission members, three are interested in uh, continuing on with the new Parks and Recreation Public Art Board would leave us one open vacancy that um, we'll reach out to the list we have from either the Parks and Recreation Board or the Public Art Commission uh, list um, that Matthew has to find a member to recommend as part of your um, uh, appointments here in December. Also, we would also, add, when it comes back in December, we'd ask that the third reading be waived so that we could get the members appointed and we could start with the first meeting in January. 
be happy to take any questions. Questions for Richard? If not, we're looking. Oh, yes, go ahead. Just Ted. real quick. Yeah. Why, why now? What, what, what's driving this to, to do this now? So it's just something that's been talked about for probably about the last 18 months. It finally got to the point um, with uh, strategic planning that it got high enough there. Uh, we thought that the end of the year was just a nice natural break with uh, the annual appointments with December to, to do that. So there's nothing driving it other than we just want to create some efficiencies. Yeah, you know, this, one of the things that we've been trying to do a lot more is with a lot of our parks projects, incorporate public art into that. Greenbelt Landing would be one of the first where um, we actually are going to engage an artist to help incorporate art designs into the overall design of the project. And we see that being a synergy moving forward that really makes a ton of sense. Um, not, you know, taking the building blocks what we've had for public art with uh, the art along the trail, the commissioning of different pieces, um, such as at the public safety building and throughout the community. And how do we kind of take that to the next step based on that 2018 public art master plan to start exactly. to incorporate that? What I would add to that too is this, it's a timing thing of the, the members too. We had a certain number of members that were ready to be done with their terms. And so we didn't want to necessarily cut anybody out. And so we had that kind of timing cycle coming up here where we had some members that were willing to stay on like the parks board for another year, knowing that this was coming at the end of this year. Got it. Thank you. Other questions? Michael? I'd move that ordinance number 1127, having been considered by the council, be voted on for passage prior to its final adoption. Second. All right. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote on the first reading? And the first reading passes by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Next, we have presentations on the state of Clive's waters. Pete. Thank you, Your Honor. Give me a moment. I'm going to pull up my presentation. Go ahead. Are you all able to see that on your monitors? Yeah. Great. So thank you, Your Honor. Happy to be here tonight to present on something we've been all collectively been working hard on for many, many years, even before we got to the point of minting our water resources master plan. That plan, though, has given us a blueprint for how we want to move forward to realizing the vision that you all set in that document. Fortunately, tonight, I don't come to present all of this by myself. I am ha very happy to say that my colleague, Reg Tokahisa, is here with us as well. Our new water resources engineer, um, Ray's done a wonderful job coming up to speed with all of the work that Clive has done historically and is doing an excellent job comp uh, partnering with all the other departments to do the diverse water work that we need to get done. If there are no sort of questions here at the top, I'll jump into these slides. We'll move through them relatively efficiently, but please don't hesitate to slow me down if you have a question about one of these. First, representation of what all went into the Water Resources Master Plan. It was engineering, which is the H&H &H you see at the top. It was management as we think about finance, staffing, cross-departmental collaboration, policy decisions, and communications, all the work that we needed to do to engage other partners so that they could be our uh, co-conspirators maybe, or are work, uh, working with us to achieve this vision that you have all set. And that vision and prioritization is what is in the center of this Venn diagram. Here are the six vision pillars that you all established. This is our guide, these are our guideposts to make sure that we're on track. If we can't map back to these and also to your strategic priorities that you set on an annual basis, then we're off track. So tonight, if you see anything that we're presenting that we've done that we can't map back to this, let us know because we want to make sure that we are consistent as we pursue this vision that you've all set. I'm not going to go through the big list here, uh, but I want to call out a few of them. That top bullet, water resources, our city of Clive at uh, cityofclive.com water resources. This is now, if we ever have a question for, from residents about where do they start in their story, so understanding the story of water and Clive, how water shapes their lives, how they are shaping Clive's water, this is the place that we want to send them. It's a flexible platform, starts with very high level information, it's very rich when it's presentation. It's that parallax scroll that you see with the maps that show the water expanding, uh, images coming in, showing different aspects of water resources in Clive. We want to keep using that as our starting point with residents. And from there, we can take them where we need to go. And this year, it was taking them to the Soil Quality Restoration Program and building up some interest in that, and also taking them to the RAIN campaign, which is the broader central Iowa-wide initiative to elevate water resources concerns and 
opportunities for residents and businesses. Obviously, we hired Ray, very happy about that. And that third point, we have got evidence this year that residents have started kind of coming along. I don't think they were ever really opposed to all these water resources projects in Clive, but they weren't top of mind. That's changing. Is their perception of Clive's water resources accurate? Well, 61, excuse me, 86 percent of residents responded positively when asked whether water, Clive's water resources were good or excellent. I think that's probably a little too rosy a picture for the state of Clive's water resources. We know we have impaired waters that are polluted still at Walnut Creek. We know we've got major erosion issues that we need to keep getting on top of. But what I take from that is that we've got folks who are interested. And with that now, we can do a lot of different things. But I don't want to um, be inaccurate because the water resources challenges we face, as all of you know better than anybody, as long as you all have served, they are significant and are going to take uh, steady work over the years and decades to come. Those are the top three I listed there. Are there others, though, that are on this list that anybody would like further clarification on? I will name that last one then, uh, uh, the ongoing execution of the flood prone property buyout program. That really is an initiative that Doug and his team have been carrying forward, strategic planning. We spend a lot of time talking about that. The water resources plan acknowledges all that. It kind of encompasses it, but just because of its scale, it really is sort of a, an entity unto itself. And we'll continue to present on that distinctly, uh, separately, because there's gonna be so much action. In fact, I think at our next meeting, we've got a couple of grants that are gonna be coming forward for your consideration that are related to that. Yes, sir. 25% increase of resident surveys in the last two years on you know, what the, uh, uh, how they rate Clive's water. That's a pretty big jump. What do you attribute to that? The storytelling aspect, communications, focusing, you know, the, the devastation of waters. What do you attribute that large of a jump to? I think a lot of it is the storytelling that we've done. I think a lot of it, though, is we had some tough water stories in these last two years. Surface water challenges. Fortunately, we didn't have a huge water event on Walnut Creek or Little Walnut Creek, but we were just on the edges of some huge storms that came through as well. I think the goats probably deserve quite a bit of credit. They're wonderful storytellers. This next slide actually kind of gives you a sense for the scope of those water stories from this past year. And the top left, you see our sort of hub for our storytelling. But then you've got, as you move to the right, all those students from Indian Hills Junior High who went out into the green belt working with our friends from Metro Waste to tell the story about how we can do a better job keeping all of that waste from getting there in the first place and also lifting up that ethic of stewardship for the rest of the community, showing a great example of what's it look like when you really care about your water. Well, you get out there and you help clean it up. You help be a good steward of it. We have big mailings that we did throughout the year too. Uh, there on the left-hand side, you see our annual mailing that goes out to folks about flood risk in the city of Clive and some other things folks can do to be good stewards of water resources. They're the big picture with the scouts. Those are our mural painting, our mural painting crew. You see the goats as well. But on the bottom left, you've got some students from the Waukee Apex program who planted many, many trees out in the Greenbelt. And that's just one volunteer opportunity. We have them all through the year. And our parks team especially does a wonderful job connecting people with those opportunities and pairing it also with good community education. Two stories that have had their ups and downs on the far right hand corner, bottom right, you've got an illicit discharge. That was uh, about 12, 10, 12 months ago, exactly. It was October of 2021 when we had that illicit discharge into Indian Hills Woods. I'm very happy to report that when you go out to Indian Hills Woods now, what you see is a remarkably uh, transformed landscape from what it looked like. And when we come in now with our vegetation re restoration in coming years, it's gonna to continue to look more and more beautiful and be more and more sustainable. The Clark Street bioretention cells, they are now up and functioning as they should. And we move now from construction into maintenance. All of this infrastructure, this green infrastructure takes maintenance the same way that the gray infrastructure takes maintenance. And I believe we've got a good plan in place to make sure we're covering that not only in this first year, but in perpetuity. Now, the biggest story related to water resources this year, I would argue that that was our soil quality restoration program. It was a year long effort. And I wanna specifically uh, thank our partners at Polk County, Polk County Soil and Water, Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, where our grant funding came from, and really thank my colleague, Julia McGuire, 
she did all of the customer service on this. Well, not all of it. I mean, we're all out there, have a lot of touches out there in the yards, raking things out. But I think Julia, between the emails that she got out in timely fashion with accurate information, all the phone calls she took, all the payments that she helped facilitate, no way this program was a success without Julia. She did a fantastic job. And for those of you who don't know, Julia has a position that sort of splits between public works and uh, community development as well. So thank you to both of those departments for giving uh, Julia's time to this project. This is how we started our storytelling with a few signs that were out in our parks and along the trail. And over the course of April through early uh, July, we generated uh, 130 interested households in Clive that wanted to do the program. Then we gave everybody the number, what their cost share was gonna look like. We dropped down to 80. And I'm starting to feel like, huh, are we gonna hit that 100 mark or not? Because we're already on the hook at that point. We'd gone and taken our, bid, our contract out to bid. We were paying our contractor, no matter how many we had to come participate. Fortunately, then we put this sign out. This was the magic. This is what started getting neighbors talking to neighbors, your neighbors coming and talking to all of you who have participated as well. And there's no better storytelling, there's no better validation of a new idea or a new concept than a friend telling to another friend, hey, this worked for me. And we had that in spades through the course of the summer. We dropped down in mid-July to about 80 folks who were signed up. And then as we put these signs out, we quickly got to the 113 that we completed plus then an additional 40 that are on the waiting list for next year, almost doubling the number of folks that we had interested and had signed up in July, just because of the ongoing storytelling we did throughout the summer. It's a huge part of our success. So here are our final stats. 113 households in one Clive Park, almost got to a million square feet of improved, but 943, 950, if you're rounding uh, to, up to a, a rounder number, that's a fantastic success. We also have uh, ongoing soil testing that we're doing on those yards. We tested them before they received their soil quality restoration. And now a year from now, we'll come back and test them again, just to see what are we seeing from both compaction and also the quality of the soil. All of these things come together to tell us how good is that at sucking up the water that lands there and keeping it from rolling down into the storm, storm sewer system. The dollars that we were able to leverage, and it got a little bit more, uh, more complicated than just our grant dollars and their cost share dollars, because we also were able to use funds from the Harbach project, and I had some other project expenses as well. But when you look at the numbers that came in from the private funds, it looks pretty darn close to that 50-50 that we were expecting. $100,000 from our grant from IDOLS, just about the same that came with private funds. The actual split ended up being closer to 47% city, 53% residences. The reason for that is we had some very large yards that hit that thousand dollar max grant award. And then they had additional square footage that we were able to add up into the, our uh, uh, total sum. Any other questions about the soil quality restoration program and our success? Yes, sir. Yeah, operationally, Pete, I thought it went really, really well, uh, you know, both from uh, your office and from the, yeah, is it quality that, that did the work yep. where they really got good at it and were fast and did a great job. I like the, uh, uh, the fact that you're going to be doing some testing so we can have some metrics that we can see really how, you know, how much of an impact that this SUR program is, has. And, mm -hmm. and is there any other type of, you know, way that we can show data or, we can really quantify this program. I know you're going to see it as as we, uh, you know, look at the lawns next year and spring comes out. But anything else that we can do to quanti give some quantifiable data to the effectiveness of this program? Yep. Um, I mean, I'm going to trust our whoops, trust our engineering team on that because there are SUDA standards about what does the quality of what does water quality soil quality restoration work get you for improved ability to catch water where it lands. So that's our standard that we would look to to quantify this. I, we have not done that quantification uh, yet for the total number of square feet here, but that's some simple math that we can get done pretty quick. And that's an important number. But the really, I think, probably more important standard that we should think about is, what does it look like actually in Clive? When we go and look at that soil a year from now, what are we actually seeing? Because we'd like to do this practice more and more frequently to meet our own stormwater requirements. But we don't want to just meet stormwater requirements in sort of 
definitions on paper, we want to see better stormwater performance in neighborhoods as well. So pairing up that lived experience with what the actual engineering standards look like is going to be important for us moving forward. I think our first big test case on that is going to be the Harbach neighborhood. So building off your last comment there, any thoughts on how we build on the success and maybe you know do some more initiatives or do some different things or additional things uh, in the future? Yeah, I have a couple ideas. Uh, we're do downloading right now with our partners at Polk County on that. A couple I would I would share. We need to find out what our funding source is going to be for this coming year, knowing that we're not going to have the extra hands from Polk County to execute a program in 2023. We also need to figure out then what kind of scale we can go to. I think that one of the most important things I learned from this is that the window of time you have to get a great result from the property owner's perspective is narrower than what maybe the government's, the STUDA standard is say you, you're going to be able to do it. We were, it was sweet in September. The growing conditions were fantastic. We had some rain that came alongside, so it didn't mean everybody had to irrigate to get germination of the seed if they decided to put seed down. We had people starting to see results almost immediately as that compost got integrated. And that created a really a strong, a strong sense of, oh, I get it now. I can, this is, this is working. It's that bottom picture that you see on that on the slide here compared to the one that's right above it after an application had just been done. Giving people a sense of an early win and that this is gonna be okay, that was key. Going past September worked for us, but we were in a riskier position. The weather could have gone significantly down for us. We ended up having some early frosty days that gave everybody a little bit of a pause, uh, and especially some of the folks who were seeding and wondering not if they're gonna get any kind of good germination or if this was gonna be something they had to wait and watch in the spring. So uh, just having a better understanding now of what that sweet spot is in September to do this is gonna be an important limit for us to keep in mind for when we decide how big do we go in future years. So any, anything else that we can do that you're thinking about on top of this, the SQR, is there, is there other things that we could be doing to do that stormwater management and things like that, that, that some of this funding, I know, I know yeah. you've been talking about funding challenges, but. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, one of our slides here, the very last one actually is one where I want to get to, to, to pick that up. Um, the one I will want to credit Councilwoman Judkins on, uh, and we talked with Polk County about this week. We had a great program because we had a great set of partners, Metro Waste, Quality Cut Landscaping, IDOLS, with the just in Polk County sharing all their knowledge as well. We brought together a really, really great team. But Quality Cut was the group that was out there doing it. We need more landscaping companies to say, hey, there's a great financial opportunity for my business here. So what we're talking about doing now is putting a sort of a get to know soil quality restoration, lunch and learn for these, invite the landscaping companies in, tell them what we did and what we learned. It sounds like our friends in Johnston are going to try and go to 150 <laughs> this coming year. Wow. Um, so we've got a lot to share there, but we'd want to bring them along too. And we're going to have a big need in, in Harbox. So we want these folks to, to know about the financial opportunity for their businesses and be ready to bid when the time comes. So that's a project we're going to get going on here over the winter. Thanks. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I have been told that to really get good results, many times a property owner will need to have multiple years of application. Mm -hmm. And my assumption is that we don't want to go back to the same places. If we do this again, we'd like to expand it more throughout the community. But as we do some of the research, is it possible to maybe build into the education some opportunities for landowners who've been participating in this to know that it, it may not just be a one and done situation to build up the soil to the point where it's really effective. I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, and that's part of, going to be part of our sort of thank you and follow up for everybody who participated in the program this year. There was a wide range of yards that we were working on. Some were in good, good shape, some were in really, really rough shape. And you did get expect differing results based on that starting point. So we'll reiterate that with property owners and talk with them about it, more things that they could do to get good results with their turf, but also talk with them now that they've taken this first step with good water stewardship, what are some other things they may wanna watch for that the city's gonna do next? Rain barrels, not a huge amount of water that you're gonna manage, 
but boy, it's powerful education when you see how fast those things fill up, fill up on just a small rain as it rolls off your roof. That's a program that we're talking about where we put do it in batch type format, build your own rain barrel type program at the Harbox Center or out at the Parks Maintenance Building or some other place. That could be a next step for folks who are starting down this journey. Just one example, but there are many others too. So here's the map. Every dot on this map represents a uh, property that participated in the SQR program for 2022, 113 total. George Lundberg Park was the park where we did 40,000 square feet. So that's, that's not on this map, I'm just focusing on the residents here. The key in the bottom left is breaking out all of those properties where we did tests. The, uh, the items in blue there are some of the to think 1970s into late 1990s, excuse me, 1980s. I'm having a hard time reading my own legend 89. there. 89, yep. And then 1990s into 2014 and 2015 to present. We batched those up into the three groups so that we could capture sort of generations of development style. The era of mass grading, where we had big developments that were created all at once, topsoil ripped out, taken away, sod thrown on top. That's what you see represented in yellow. Everything in blue was prior to that and everything in red represents development that was overwhelmingly done after the post-construction stormwater ordinance was in place, which meant that when you disturbed those soils or you built something, you had to restore organic content and you had to decompact your soils as well. And so we are curious as we look at the testing we've done, are we going to see interesting differences between those red properties versus yellow versus blue? The one that I'm particularly interested in is that yellow versus red, uh, but also the blue, just because those are yards that have been in place for a long time. What is the state of their soil health? So this is not something I would say meets the definition of sort of a, a research standard sort of work that we've done. Yeah. yeah, but it is still, I think, going to give us some interesting signal to help us get, keep, keep getting better at this year over year. Okay, so here's the meat of what I'd like to get your direction on tonight. What we're going to do in 2023, long list, and we can talk about all of these. These are all ideas I believe that have come before you in one shape or another, but it's those top six that I'd like to talk about tonight in particular. The Harbach Stormwater Partnership Program, standing up with the first member of our natural resources team, standing up that team here in the first part of 2023, our neighborhood engagement around the wide range of things happening in the Northwest neighborhoods, so many of which have to do with water and amenities that are close to Walnut Creek and our water. The community education about our irrigation and stormwater rates, which is coming this spring. I want to talk a little bit about the BMP inspection strategy. This is where we're going to talk about those private owned BMPs and public BMPs that were a big part of the water resources master plan process. And then finally, what we might be able to get done this coming year with the cost share program for more SQR and a broader, uh, more uh, sort of a, a bigger pot of money that could be used for a diverse set of water resources projects in the city using a new grant. So let's talk about Harbach. We started before Rachel transitioned to her position and, and then before uh, Ray was able to join the team, we started talking with the neighborhood about how we were going to meet our stormwater requirements for the Harbach Street reconstruction. When we started, we were under working with the assumption that we were doing phase one of Harbach this year, which is now near completion, and then getting into phase two, which would be from, I believe, 105th Street, excuse me, um, 85th Street over to 83rd Street over to 86th. Thank you. Now that timeline is changing. The CIP discussion from this past uh, uh, council meeting and in our, in our workshop, the council directed staff to see if there was a way to do a flip and bring in another street, which now has in turn meant that we are going to push phase two of Harbach, if the council just continues down this path, phase two of Harbach into 2025, as opposed to 2024. That creates a bigger window of time here when we can work on meeting all of these stormwater requirements, though I think it's really important that we immediately get going on meeting the requirements for the first phase of work that have already been done. 
In addition to the street reconstruction, we know with the 86th Street neighborhood plan, there are many other improvements that are gonna be made, some of which are gonna come with stormwater requirements. How do we wanna meet those? We've been working sort of with the idea that similar to with the street reconstruction, we are going to need to use every available inch of green space and private property that's willing and public property that we can to meet those current and also future stormwater requirements. I have a preference in this program to work with residences if we, as much as we can, because I think it creates benefits around building up their stewardship ethic. It makes them feel like their city is redirecting, reinvesting directly in them. I think those are big wins, but I don't think we're going to be able to meet all of our requirements just working with private property owners in the neighborhood. There's also going to be stuff we need to do on our parks and working with some of the bigger commercial properties if they're willing. So more definition to come to this program, but I do think that we'll need to get started still here in the spring of 2023, at the very least with getting our recruiting done, identifying those folks who want to do some of the easiest types of practices, the SQR and the trees. That's where we want to keep things focused. Any questions about sort of our thinking at this point? But you saw a, a tree sale in 24. Can you talk a little about that? Mm -hmm. That would be separate from this. Okay. The Harbach Partnership Program has always been designed to be city pays 100% because we need to meet our own requirements. The proposed tree sale program, I think, would be better set up as a cost share where the city was able to make a big bulk purchase similar to what our friends over in Johnston do. The reason I like the cost share too is if we make the big bulk purchase, we're gonna be able to compete for a better price for those trees. We're also gonna have a little bit of control on the species because there are some that we think are gonna do better than others. But it also then requires the property owner to have some skin in the game. We need them to care about this as much as we care about it. And when they pay for it, they care about it a little differently than if they just get it for free. So we can come in and help them plant it and get it done, but then the watering and the steward, the maintenance of it after that, that's what we need them to step up. At least that's my early thinking about what a tree program would look like, but we're still uh, many, many months away from implementing something like that. And there would need to be a budget consideration for all of you to take up before we narrow, narrow down on our specifics. Okay, so you'll hear a lot from me and Ray about, and from your constituents about uh, this program as Ray and I go out and engage with them. Natural resources team. So this was one of the key tactical next steps that we identified for year one in implementation of the water resources master plan. This list is almost identical to a list that I put forward uh, back in 2021 when we were considering this team. The only change here that you see has to do with street trees, which at that time we didn't know where the, those were gonna live with this team or some other place. Um, the tree moves on public land would continue to live with this team, but the street trees would be moving over to the public works team to manage. The list there at the top of managing Clive's public resources, uh, the public BMPs, that's not an exhaustive list, but it does give you some of the very biggest ones that take that ongoing annual maintenance. Just like gray infrastructure, gray infrastructure takes regular maintenance. This team will be doing much of that work. They're also though very much embedded in the parks team. This is just, when we hire this person, they will come on board as a parks specialist, assuming that the council is still good with that direction. And they will be supporting a number of activities that happen in the parks team traditionally, like the snow operations the parks responsible for, like leading volunteers and interns on natural resource improvements like tree plantings, invasive species removal, supporting the GOAT program probably in the future as well. The coordination between me, Ray, Richard, Jeff, Doug, Matt, and everybody else that works within our teams, that's what makes the natural resources team tick. We are hiring people, yes, who would, or one person this year who will specifically be sort of named as a part of that team, but all of us put our time into that type of work. All of us are, have a responsibility to the success, for the success of the team. Did you yes. explain what you said about trees, that street trees yeah. are moving? Yep. So the, who's doing what? So the big trees in like the green belt or in the parks, those are the parks team's responsibility though. I'm sure if we needed help with machinery, to, uh, Richard, they would be, reaching out to public works to be able to help out. But the tree, street trees, like the ones that went up along Clark Street, 
um, some of those because I think we're buying some new equipment in the parks in the public works team to be able to sort of chip what they cut. They're going to be able to handle some of that type of activity moving forward. We've had that function move around a little bit um, in the past. Uh, typically, historically, what it's been for anything in the right of way, including trees, it's been the public works team responsibility. We had a, a transition of that when we only had one chipper to the parks team uh, for a while because we only had that one chipper. And so one thing that we did in the budget process and we won't be uh, getting the piece of equipment for a while is having that secondary chipper as kind of an insurance policy when we have things like derechos or other wind events to be able to have multiple teams that we can send around the city. But with that, that gives us more flexibility and wanted to shift some of the load off of the parks team uh, back to public works for the just the right of way trees, which was a function that they were normally uh, having when we only had, but we only had one tool at the time. Now we have the two tools, hopefully once we get the second tool, which is taking a little while because of the kind of equipment uh, purchasing delays. Uh, but that that's part of this transition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Outcomes we want to achieve with the natural resources team. We want to make sure that we are defining now, and this was a key direction, piece of direction we got from the council when we did the water resources master plan. We need to know what is the status of our assets right now, the public assets first. So coming up with that plan for those inspections and making sure we're solid on that, making sure then we're defining the management strategy for those diverse BMPs. We want to get that established and Ray has already set, uh, started working on that in conjunction with partners at Public Works and with Richard and myself. We have some uh, new public BMPs that have come on board like the Alice's Road Stormwater Wetland. It's about a year and a half old now, but certainly the rain guardians and the bioretention cells on Clark, all the assets up at CPSC. We want to make sure we've got a well-defined plan for how we're managing those. We want to make sure that we are uh, that team is supporting the tree plantings that are gonna be done for the stormwater partnership program. Tree planting is something that's such a great thing to do with volunteers that we don't need to pay a contractor to do it. That's how we got the trees planted on Clark Street. That's a more cost effective way to go. We also wanna make sure that as we're getting our hands wrapped around our current public BMPs that we, there are some that need and are high value sort of targets. If we make some improvements now, we're gonna get better performance. Let's identify those so we can better now fold them into a CIP process or other workflows that we have. That's that point there about identifying two to three public BMPs for structural improvement in this coming year. You can see the end of the rest of the list, uh, the bottom one there with the green belt goats grazing browsing strategy. We wanna keep getting better and better at using those goats uh, from year to year as well. That's gonna take some high level strategic thinking. You may need to get McCoy to help you out with it. Yeah, yeah, well. I just hope we, you know, we can keep the goats in order. It was about this time last year when Steve decided to go on his Ferris Bueller's day off. And well, don't jinx us now. You had I didn't say it. Say it. Yeah, good three days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Another one that's going to be a, a very, very large lift, specifically because of the vegetation, the trees that are going to be coming down, and the detours with the trail. As Waukee goes through with their sewer project, especially east of Alice's Road, that is going to be a very large disruption, especially for the houses that are on the north side of the creek. We have to be excellent in our communications with those folks and others. We have to help them manage that change. Now, the date there, November 30th at Schuler Elementary School. Uh, after talking about that during our monthly water resources plan meeting yesterday, the team decided that we want to go a little bit early, go at, stretch that into 2023, the very first part of 2023, because we're not pinned down yet with the 2080 agreement with Waukee. Waukee needs to be a part of this meeting. It's going to be their contractor who's in there doing the sewer work. They're going to need to be able to share some of that detail with all the neighbors. So they've got to have their ducks ready in a row before I think that it's comp that we should, then we, before we can go confidently to the neighborhood and give them all the information that they need. But this is a, the first of what will have to be many, many touches over the course of all of 2023 and coordinated touches with our partners in Urbandale and Waukee. The trail closure, as we discussed during the CIP workshop, will be from 156th Street all the way to Alice's Road. That section where 156th Street Trail comes in, that's Urbandale's trail. And then it hooks up with ours between 156 and Alice's. 
Will it, what will be the uh, status of the closure for that entire period of time? There'll probably be some ebb and flow. There'll be some places where the detour needs to change as work gets done, but it's gonna be for the most part, a lot of disruption. And we wanna be forthright with the neighborhood about that from the very start. We'll also need to put all of our other assets together to make sure we can update people with those uh, information on the project, whether it's an email or directing them to a construction page. I understand what you're saying about, you know, wanting to have the details with, you know, Waukee coming in to do the, the sewer line replacement and waiting to do that meeting. But um, any thoughts on sending out kind of initial communications, maybe not a meeting, but, you know, hey, here's an email, here's a flyer or something like that. And we yeah. So I think that the initial email and letter that we send will be for households that go from Alice's Road and all of our Northwest neighborhoods to everybody who is gonna be anywhere near sort of where our trail picks up to the east of Alice's Road and over to it as well. We'll probably stretch all the way up to Meredith as well. I'm, we'll have to think about how far south we wanna stretch down to, to capture that audience. I'm expecting a great group though. That's why I wanna do this at Schuler Elementary School. When we send that letter, it will be sharing with them not only the information about the meeting, but some of those big headlines for them to expect. That's when we're going to start taking the Band-Aid off, telling them this is going to be a major disruption to a trail that you all use quite frequently, we hope. It also means that there's going to be some vegetation that has to come down as they do this. So we're going to go ahead and communicate that early. We're not hiding the ball on this at all. In fact, I would rather almost tell people the worst case scenario here and then 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 get people feel a little more relieved if it's not quite as disruptive as we you know it potentially could be. But accuracy and timeliness is key. So what's the timing on that on those mm -hmm. now since we're you know, changing the meeting? Right, so the 2080 has been in negotiation since September and we're working diligently, Jeff May representing the city working closely with the folks in Waukee. Christina and her team have done good markup on all of that. And there are more rounds of markup that will need to happen before we get to good. But Waukee currently is hopeful, and we'll see if they can stick to this. They're hopeful that it's gonna be December, January timeframe when they're gonna be setting their public hearing to then take bids for the project. Originally, we wanted to get started as soon as conditions allowed, right? When it gets cold, that's a good time to do the sewer work. We're not going to be far from that when this ultimately gets started, unless there's some massive hiccup in the 2080 agreement. But I think we're still on track to get started here in the winter time, which means we're on track for those first neighborhood meetings, potentially into the end of December, middle of December. We have to dance around the holidays a little, but certainly I think we're can uh, early January, mid January would work. One layer of complication to all of this too that we're just being mindful of as we go through the legal review is that the goal is ultimately that the sewer and sewers in this area um, including potentially some of five sewers will eventually go over to the wra for maintenance and and, and oversight and so we have to think through what that means because the wra has certain expectations on any sewers that they receive um, for maintenance purposes, and that obviously alleviates a maintenance uh, need for us down the road. Uh, but that there's just a lot of moving pieces with that um, that we're trying to be very cognizant of as, you know, Christina and her team are doing the review and thinking of, okay, what do we need to have incorporated in the Waukee agreement? Because it eventually is going to probably get assigned to the WRA. Um, so that gets a little bit more complicated. But, uh, but again, Clive controls, you know, our, you know, the easement, um, uh, in this area. And so Waukee needs us to sign off on it. And as we've advised Waukee, I wouldn't set a public hearing for awarding a contract till you have a 20 ID agreement with us because you don't have a project unless you have an easement. So those are part of the discussions that we're having. We're hoping things move a little bit faster here, um, but it's really on Waukee to, yeah. to meet those those questions that we have in the 20 ID agreement. Yeah, uh, yeah totally, totally get that. We want to make sure our, our questions are answered and our concerns <laughs> are addressed. Um, but I think I think it's just especially with the holidays and all of that kind of intermixed. I think having the, maybe even multiple notifications of, of you know, hey, this meeting's coming up because we've, we've gotten some feedback previously, like, hey, I got this mailer, you know, two days before the meeting, I can't change my schedule, right? Yeah, we don't mail two days before the meetings. We'll give everybody at least two weeks uh, and follow up then with social media and digital communications. The first meeting is where we typically start to get that email list just uh, generated, though we can also uh, capture email addresses from folks who just visit our website. 
And it's a balance, right? Because, you know, you get folks that say, oh, well, you told me two weeks ago, I forgot. Yep. And then you get other folks that say, oh, you only told me two days before. Yep. So well, it, it's just it, that multiple touch points, right? It is. It is. And, and it's keep the spigot open. It's, yeah, it can be frustrating when people say, you didn't tell me about this. Well, I don't fault people for being really, really busy with other parts of their lives. They have other things that are going on. This is not something, their built environment is not something that they're thinking about, except that they're expecting that it's going to be there just as they've always experienced it. We are coming in and changing things. So that's on us. That's on our, our an onus on us to be able to then meet them where they're at. Sounds good. Yeah, especially with the holidays. That makes yeah. it even tougher. So I'd, I'd prefer to push into January. Don't We don't have to dance around the holidays. And also that gives us a chance to push it through the January newsletter, which is one of our biggest communications tools. Can you speak uh, social media? Do you, can we try or have we tried geofencing? Um, that message gets so broad, right? And if we can geofence it to that neighborhood, to that yeah. affected group, right? Then it's concentrated right there. Mm -hmm. um, we yep. can even do some boost or pay for the, some of that. But, you know, the, the, my area doesn't really need to know so, so much detail that you're going to be flooding this group with. I just don't, if, if we haven't tried it, it's kind of a cool tool. But mm -hmm. I agree, but we don't want to care, cast too narrow of a net either and, and do just like this subdivision and that's right. it, right? right? So it's a little bit of a balance on it. Yeah. I think you could roughly do everything north of Douglas. Yeah. And all the neighborhoods north of Douglas and in Clive, and you could capture a pretty good net. For Doesn't that mean you're not still communicating the other way right. to everybody. Right. The, the water bill, the, yeah, you sure. know, all that. We can definitely do uh, look what our options are on that one. Stormwater and irrigation rate changes. Uh, Matt and Liz gave everybody a little bit of an update over the previous meetings on the irrigation changes that we're considering. Here is a reiteration of what you've seen already from the Water Resources Master Plan for plans for the stormwater. The breakdown of households is what I wanna draw your attention to especially. Most folks are going to see what has been a pretty normal increase consistent with what we've done in the past, to moving up from where we're at today up to 1115 per month. Folks though who are in the large group there of 750 households that are gonna feel something a little, quite a bit different. Um, there may be some pain associated with that, but I think that the logic that you have all articulated in the plan is sound. If you use the resource more than others, then you should pay for that use. It's not exactly like using more gallons of water. We don't measure your storm water the same way. And it varies obviously from year to year, depending on how much storm water happens to fall. But over time, I think we can confidently say that when you have more impervious surface that you on your roof, your driveway, whatever the case may be, you are ultimately going to be stressing out the larger stormwater conveyance system more or using that system more than somebody who has less impervious surface. So that's the core of our logic. The, one, the primary ways we're going to talk about this with the neighborhood if this is still the council's direction, will be in the spring, we'll create a video similar to what we did with the lost video, an animation. And it'll be a pairing both the irrigation rate change with the stormwater rate change. We'll have a landing page that everybody goes to for that as well. It'll be built out of cityofclive.com. And then we'll also be sharing it across digital platforms and all of our print platforms as well. So folks aren't surprised when they get their first two utility bills, and they start to see some changes from what they'd seen in the past year. Most of this activity, and all the prep of it before it is going to be kicking off really January, February, March, and then March, April, May. May is key because that's when the new rates are going to, uh, folks are going to see those on those first May utility bills. I think I'm right on that, Liz. Is that correct? Yeah. So within our newsletter, I'm assuming not only we're going to have this in there, but I would hope we'd have it multiple times. Absolutely. Those reminders, not just once. Yep. I want to make sure that we go through the budget process and that it's all minted in March so that everybody knows at that point, okay, they had a chance to come and voice their concerns if they had them. But staff is moving forward on this as if the policy direction has been given from the council. So when we are communicating with the neighbors at that point, it's not to ask for them to come and amend the policy it is to tell them that this is the decision that has been made by the council. 
as the council will recall, typically our processes and for the budget processes, you approve your budget that second meeting in March, and that's usually the first reading of the utility ordinance changes. And so then you'd have the two meetings in April uh, as well for the second and third reading of the order of the rate changes. And then it gets implemented in May for June bills for receipt in July. That's kind of how the so timing the works. The first bill that you could see this on would be June? Yeah. Okay. It would be applied to the May usage for, for the June bill payable. That's really only two newsletters then April and May that would go out in advance. Yeah. I guess you could do it in June too, just as a great. Another oh, yeah. oh yeah, you definitely would do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You could you could hit it May, June, July. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Especially as you get into the heavier irrigation months, right? When That's... we talk about the irrigation rate changes, we're going to want to do more than just talk about the rates during those months. The water conservation reminders. Once we land on that final, you know, Liz and I are working on kind of based on your feedback what that. Uh, tier irrigation rate structure could look like and bring that back to you in january with the with the cash flows um, we'll want to do continue to do water conservation education related to irrigation and storm water all at the same time and that's where it made a lot of sense to pair these together kind of a water resources education component because they kind of feed off each other in different ways yeah i agree with everything you said here the early and often touches people don't like surprises Nope. And they're going to get some surprise. Yep. When you look at your utility bill, your stormwater number is your small number. And these, even for those folks who are in that 750 households or more that are going up to 1784, that's still going to look like a relatively small number. But by the percentage increase, it's significant for these folks to see this. So I would expect that we're going to need to do quite a bit of educating and explaining for folks. The variable one is going to be that irrigation. So I think. Uh, I, I would anticipate just because it's going to be so, so much more money that we're talking about and because it will be variable depending on the activity that they choose to take on, how much they decide to water, that's going to be one where we'll probably hear quite a bit more. But it's an important step. Or if they're doing SQR. <laughs> <laughs> or if they're doing SQR, that's right. There's going to be some uh, cost associated. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Ray to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing from an inspection strategy in this coming year. I'm sure, Pete, you were doing such a great job. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, part of our MS4 permit is the post-construction stormwater management in particular, the inspection of our best management practices, which satisfies the requirement that we have an inspection of all runoff devices and a watershed assessment program. Um, in previous years, council had asked our water resources engineer where the city could make improvements with regards to the MS4. And at that time, the biggest deficiency discussed was the lack of inspection and maintenance on the city's post-construction BMPs. Since that conversation, my understanding is that we've reviewed hundreds of site plans and filled out our inventory, thank you, Rachel Conrad, to a current total of 284 components. This number will continue to increase as more sites perform construction activities that require adherence to our stormwater ordinance. Um, of these 284 practices, 247 are privately owned and 37 are owned by the city of Clive. Um, not a mistake number, 28 of the 37 Clive owned have been inspected. The gap there is new practices that have just come online recently. So we haven't had an inspection cycle since we've added them. Um, and 28 of the 247 privately owned. Uh, right now we employ a pass fail system in six categories, debris, erosion, vegetation, structure, sediment, and a catch all other. Um, so that composes our high level overview um, and the ha having that data set and continuing to augment that data set on an annual basis helps us inspect all of the above ground components um, every five years as required by permit. This slide encompasses um, the high level overview that helps us inspect, sorry, repeating myself, just kidding. Um, <laughs> So this slide covers how the sort of inspection breaks down our primary inspection up on the top. That blue is that stuff that is happening every year. Um, so ongoing in the background, every year we'll continue to have these pass fail inspections. Um, these primary inspections help us identify immediate maintenance for the coming year. So we inspect them in the winter. Um, we notice that things need fixing. If it's emergent, we fix it immediately. Sometimes it's not emergent and we put it on our radar to put it on the list for maintenance. Um, a few practices each year, this is the 
middle bar, the detailed inspection, a few practices each year need to be designated for a detail inspection. So this is more than just, is there sediment at the structure? Is there vegetation at the outfall? Um, and typically those detailed inspections are going to be with failures in our major category or a sufficient number of miners that we need to look at it more closely. Um, the last piece is the special maintenance and projects. These only come online if they, uh, obviously safety first. So if there's a hot spot in the watershed that we need to be touching and it's a safety concern, we get to put our attention there. Um, and then council has already expressed that we'd like to be doing public, um, public maintenance and public improvements before private so that we understand what we're asking uh, our private BMP owners to do, like do first and then ask others to do in line with us. Um, there's further prioritization underneath what would go into a special maintenance item or project and all of that just gets, it, get, it goes through a calculus and it comes down to public before private and then does it make sense in the watershed? Do we already have attention there? Do we already have equipment there? Can we get, does the, do the volumes make sense? Does it make sense to do the work on the BMP? Um, so the last piece is changes to our MS4 permit. So I get to write a report, it's due the 31st of December. Um, our current MS4 is good from 2019 through 2024. We need to file for renewal at the beginning of 2024. I think the only interesting, exciting thing about the slides, unless you really like dates, is that our current permitter, um, well, the current permit writer has retired. And so our new permit will be written by somebody. Um, and we don't know if it's going to be a copy paste. We don't know if there are going to be significant um, changes but we already have relations and communications in place that if we don't understand any of the changes, we can ask and get further clarification. Um, so yeah, that's the most exciting thing here. Any questions? Go back to public versus private, one slide back, yeah. public before private, that's on the maintenance. Is that on the inspections as well? We have begun private inspections. Part of it is so that um, because there's so many of them, we just have to start them sooner before we can ask private BMP holders to do any work. So um, in the same way that we came to all of our public BMPs and said, we need to understand what we have before we prioritize the work we do. Similarly, we need to take a look at the private BMPs that are within the city, get a good understanding of what is out there before we start identifying where we need to focus and ask for changes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, getting into the weeds, I don't want to do, but um, if you're out there in the private and you're looking or assessing them and we see something, let's, let's enforce it right then instead of saying, yeah, here's a private, here's a private, here's a private, getting all the numbers, going around to all of them, and then coming back and saying, okay, this is what we have. Now let's go inspect. We were just there. Now we're touching them twice. Sure. I don't think it has to be all 247 private inspected before we ever ask somebody to bring their, in, their BMP into compliance, but being able to understand how heavy is the lift and have we done similar work needs to happen before we ask a private <laughs> owner to do the same. That's where I... I don't know if that's the, the whole direction of the council. That's where I part ways, mm -hmm. if it is. Um, it's an agreement we had with the property owner originally. They know it's on that agreement. We enforce it. Now, whether we give them some time or some efforts or creativity to do it, I don't think we should say it's such a big deal. Mm, we're going to back off and allow or have us do our 27 before we ask you to do your 37. I say we hit them with it and be kind and walk them through it, right? Not punitive and, and iron fisted, but we got to start somewhere. And I'm just saying, let's start enforcing it now. Agreed. I'd, so on the point where um, we can ask I think there are, I think the last piece that you said, the part where there are opportunities to improve the BMPs is where you get to go with this. Because on the one hand, you could ask them to come in compliance per the documents from 1984, and then they'd have something that was in compliance with something that is, they'd have a BMP that is in compliance with not our stormwater ordinance. So if there are opportunities, I'd prefer to take a closer look and see 
is there an opportunity to not only bring this into compliance per whatever grandfathered status you have, I'd prefer to bring it into compliance with what we have today. And yeah, agreed that that's an opportunity for a partnership and that we can ask people to come in compliance sooner and we don't have to per perfectly fix all 27 of our practices first in order to do that. Um, um, thanks, one Pete. Point, no, 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 one other oh, point there, it's, it's that last one about being in line with the strategic plan. There are parts of the city where we have a lot cooking right now. Northwest neighborhoods, 86th Street neighborhoods. There are some places where you all have given us direction saying, we are gonna dedicate a ton of time here. Let's get this right. And so those are some of the places that we intend to be already very active through our engagement or through a partnership program like the Harbor Stormwater Partnership Program. Those are the places we think it would make sense then also to look at those private BMPs and work on bringing them into a better state, whether that's compliance with what their previous sort of requirement was or even better, an even elevated standard that's more consistent with the rules we have in place today. I'm with you though, Councilman. I mean, I thought like, we're out there, let's touch all of them, but there's gonna have to be some prioritization that we bring to it on an annual basis because there are just so many of them that we're trying to get our arms around. I think even if they see a random approach, right? Uh, kind of our rental deal or whatever have you, if they don't know if they're being inspected, that's even better than just kind of announcing that we're gonna be hands off for the next five, 10 years until we get our in-house done. It just kind of gives them a free, go here i think um, the only correction there is that we're, we're not waiting until all the in-house ones are done before we go before we pursue opportunities with private bmps more to come devil's in the detail right it is it is and the other one that i'll put out there that we've had every single year i'm sure every year you both can think of the one that hot spot issue that comes up where a council person is contacted by a constituent saying, I've got this idea, I've got this, this problem, I need your help. And then that's gonna focus our attention. That's part of what, how you all engage with staff as well and we're gonna to need to be responsive to that. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Building on that, we're here at our last slide. So two of the highest profile things that we're gonna be doing in this coming year potentially. Soil quality restoration cost share 2.0. How big can we go? Depends on how much funding we're going to be able to put against this. The funding source that it seems to make the most sense to me at this point, but would take clear direction from all of you, would be revenues that would come from, more likely than not, uh, the, either the stormwater utility or the water, the, uh, water utility because of increased revenue from the change in the irrigation rate. But we're going to need to discuss that more and make sure that we map out with PFM and others what the actual financial situation is going to look like. The good news, though, is that we have a pretty good sense for how far we can go, depending on what the cost of compost and aeration installed is. We were 21 cents a square foot for the program we did this past year. I would expect a higher number next year. But now we've got the math in place. It's a pretty simple formula. We can see how many square feet we're going to be able to do. And based on that, and then the average size of the participating households, we'll be able to figure out how many households we can handle. So Pete, as part of that analysis um, that you provide to us, um, can you make sure that, you know, this is a, it's a zero sum game, right? So if we're taking money out of stormwater and irrigation to go towards this, then it's not going towards something else, mm -hmm. right? So what I would like to know is what is that something else that we're not going towards yep. at whatever different levels we're talking about. Yep. Right? That opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. um, I would be, I think it will be, since we're not going to have as many hands to execute a program like this, I think it's unreasonable to think we can do anything like the scale we did this last year. I think it would be uh, heroic if we were to be able to get to 50. The amount of revenue that I think we'll create with these changes to the stormwater and the irrigation or then the water uh, utilities will be greater than what, would, what it would take to do, let's say 30, 40 SQRs, even if we got a very different number with the uh, compost installed. So I feel like we're in pretty good shape there that we wouldn't use up all of the new revenue, but there would still be an opportunity cost. Right. This next one though, about the standalone Clive Water Resources Grant Program. 
So we talked about this during the water resources master planning process, and we didn't reach a perfect sort of summary of where we wanted to be. There was some disagreements still that we knew we were going to need to, disagreements, not the right word. There were still some questions we needed to answer, some questions about just the logic of starting with the carrot before you bring the stick. Some of the, some of the questions that Councilman McCoy just brought up as well. So those questions are still here in front of us. The good news though, is that when we minted that plan, it also included the standing up of the grant program, starting with a very modest $10,000 for this coming fiscal year. That would be sort of on the ground, starting to recruit projects probably this spring and summer, implement the projects over the summer and fall for reimbursement in the fall at the beginning of the next fiscal year. Since then, we've also learned a lot through the SQR program about what's it take to get interest. Every community that we talked to about their water resources grant program equivalent was they have a hard time spending all the money. Part of that, I think, is just because of the way that most of them are structured. It's a reimbursement, mm -hmm. a batch system where you keep it simple. You work with a great hook. We're going to make your yard more beautiful and it's going to do better at catching water and you're going to have fewer inputs. That's a great hook. SQR works. It's a great hook. Telling people that you here's the laundry list of all the things you could do with your water resources approach on your yard. You could do a rain garden. You could do a rain barrel. You could do native plantings, all these things. It's just a more difficult story to tell and to get people excited about it. Plus, when they feel like they're the ones who have to put all the money in first and then get reimbursed, it's just one more hurdle that you have to get over. Because of that learning that we've done in the SQR program, my own instinct is to go toward more of these batched approaches with one practice in mind. Let's do a build your own rain barrel and let's get 50 rain barrels out across the city. Let's do the new SQR program and let's get 30, 40 more SQRs done. If we're going to keep the grant program sort of as we envisioned, it would still be a nice pot of money and it could potentially be a place where we make even larger financial awards for very large projects. So think about the ponds that are privately owned in Clive. Think about some of the areas where we have um, uh, maybe even a property owner like, like uh, some who have a, a part of Walnut Creek Stream Bank that they're concerned about. They want to stabilize it sort of on us to come alongside, but maybe they like Jeff Carter want to move more uh, quickly and put some of their own money into it as well. A grant program like this could help us tackle some of those higher dollar type projects that the homeowners associations bring to us, or maybe even large commercial properties bring to us as well. So I put it before you all tonight still as an open question and appreciate direction. And it doesn't need to be finalized tonight. We still got some time to figure out the program. If you choose not to go with this program that's looking at larger type of asks, then we already are set up to set up one that would be more the traditional a la carte program where folks come, with, come to us with everything from I have a rain barrel I'd like to put in and it's going to cost me 500 bucks, give me 250 to I've got a four bay that I want to put on our pond. So it's not so expensive to dig sediment out of it. It's going to cost me a hundred thousand dollars to do it. Can you come alongside with some amount of grant funding? Well, I think it may be a, a blend at the front end here where maybe we do some a la carte stuff uh, on stuff that maybe we're not ready to go all in yet, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's any question, certainly not in my mind, that the the way that we structured the SQR with the batch purchase um, is the reason why it was successful. If, if you're requiring the resident to go out, find their own contractor, pay up front, and then ask for reimbursement, they're taking all the risk. They're paying more in all likelihood. Um, and, and it's just more complicated. And we, we would have had a fraction of the numbers that we had with SQR. So I think on the programs that we, we wanna be, whether we wanna pilot it or we wanna be really serious about, those are the ones that we start with that batch program and then you have the a la carte available. But Ted, to your point, I do think it's important that we do a little bit of a la carte just because it's a way for us to experiment too yeah. and see what do we wanna do for the next batch right. that you know, homeowner totally comes agree. to us and says, hey, this worked great on my lawn or yep. mm -hmm. that didn't work out so great. So maybe don't do that one. Right. But we also have the experience of a lot of other communities to learn from. We don't just have to do it ourselves. Many of the metro communities have been ahead of us on doing these BMPs. I'd like to go back to where we were a year ago in hearing that our 
best outcomes for money invested were recommended to be the soil quality restoration and the tree planting. I think I heard you say postponing the tree planting to 2024 before we get into that, but I'm kind of interested in hearing about that. I want the whole thing to be characterized in the context of what gives us the biggest benefit, yep. cost benefit ratio, basically. Yep. So I want to hear about it in that context. Practices in the ground. Yep. You know, certainly with, with the kind of money we're talking about, it's not, it's not a big pool of money. What do we say? $10,000 right there. And, but this is a learning program for all of us. You know, it's a start. And Susan, I know we've had this conversation. It's, it's better than nothing. Right. We start, we learn from it. We, we understand that other communities have uh, successfully implemented programs like this. Let's learn their lessons there and continue, uh, you know, a combination of a la carte and, and batch programs as we continue to move this forward. You know, but the whole point is let's move it forward. Mm -hmm. I think that in 2023, we can look back at, a, uh, from when we get there, we'll look back at 2022 and say, we knew we wanted to move fast. We've really started moving fast in 2022. It was a lot of fun. And we got a lot of practices in the ground. And we changed a lot of hearts and minds. You know, and, and with this on the trees, I don't necessarily want to wait till 24. You know, we could figure out small things. And, uh, okay, you know, that's, that's a great way to... Uh, it, it solves, we all love trees, right? So it does a lot of different things. So no doubt. figure out some kind of a batch program with the trees in 23. Okay, that's good direction. Um, we'll talk about potential funding sources for all that and whether it makes sense from a timing standpoint to do those, it would have to be fall 2023. I don't think we'd be able to get everything ready to go for spring 23 for tree planting. Most of them are in the fall anyway. Yep, most of those would be in the fall. So we'll need to talk a little bit about funding opportunities. Um, it may be something where we're, some of that would need to come from this $10,000 that is loosely sort of organized as a grant type program, but those would be grants that we make as cost shares for the cost of these trees. I'll just need to confirm that we can actually source all of those before we uh, commit to doing a, a, a program like that. What size trees are you? I'm gonna defer to my expert here on bright size tree. Um, You'd probably want to find a balance of a tree that's big enough that would survive a lot easier, but one that's not too big that they couldn't haul it home in their vehicle. So probably neighborhood of a one inch caliper tree. So a tree that's probably about that big around is probably the best. You get a pretty big tree for a really decent price as well. If you're buying in bulk, like Pete was talking about. And if we needed to put together teams that could come out once you got the tree to your house, or if you were somebody who didn't have the means to do it, if we could put together our silver cord hours for all of those kids, what a great thing for all of our friends in high school and the middle schools to do. Come out, help us with the planting program. And while we're doing it the same way we did with the SQR, tell them about all the good. Tell them about all the reasons that this matters. Convert them if they aren't already converted to being people who care about water stewardship the way that all of us do. That's good direction. I appreciate that. We'll get started on working up what a tree program could look like for 2023 and also what some with uh, the dollars we have, what the a la carte style look could be. So we can put that out on the street for folks who are ready to go. Very good. Thanks, Pete. Mm -hmm. we'll move on to the legislative priorities. And we'll be able to I think, cover these relatively quickly. I'm going to dress Jagged over. <clears throat> So our legislative priorities were in your packet. They are largely verbatim for what we had in past years. There are a couple things though that we have added. Uh, point number three there under number two, specifically saying that if there is intention to address property taxes in Clive or any other large revenue source for the cities, there should be responsible engagement with city councils and city staff before that. No surprises. Any questions about that? Good luck. I know, our, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it comes down to how well, that we that's right, hope. that's right. We can know, but it's worth calling it out. And also stating our receptiveness to it. We're happy to be part of, if they wanna change up the solution, the, the game here, we're not gonna tell them that they can't, it's per their prerogative to do it, but let's do it in a way mm -hmm. that respects the input that all of you have to offer as well. On point number three, about water resources excellence, that builds on many of the things that we've talked about in past years. 
One of the new ones though, that uh, we've added here would be point number E, excuse me, point number F about DNR securing uh, a pro program to help cities deal with PFAS chemicals, especially firefighting foams. That's something our fire department is working on quite a bit. And then the final one about a more streamlined permitting process that better aligns with what we have to do at the federal level when we're working in stream banks. I'm and interested space. in F, um, what would you, what would your ask? It's a dangerous ask in my eyes, but what, what's our ask for them? What, uh, what we found out over the last few years is the EPA's determined that uh, this PFAS chemical, it's in a lot of things, but particularly in firefighting foam, is very, very uh, dangerous to people uh, and very, very dangerous to the environment. They call it a uh, forever chemical. And so all these fire departments are sitting around with this foam and, and no way to dispose of it. And you know, there's 833 fire departments in Iowa. And what's gonna happen is if they don't get a way to secure it, people are gonna train with it, they're gonna dump it out. Um, that, that's just the reality of it. So we've had some meetings, one meeting with the DNR, just sharing um, our concern and our desire to try to get some funding. A number of states have done take back programs where um, the, the DNR type agencies will collect this and store it simply to protect the environment more than anything. Uh, but right now the DNR doesn't have any money. Um, they're, very, they're very interested but they're also very cautious because um, the more and more they learn about the PFAS uh, chemical, uh, the more they're not sure that they wanna control that. So it's a big unknown. It's gonna be a very expensive thing uh, for city, state, and, and um, the government, the um, airport fire chief said that the airport has gotten rid of foam and it costs them $20,000 a gallon to get rid of. Wow. So we it's a big deal for everybody. And uh, we're trying to get it on the DNR's radar. <clears throat> and the really the next step is we're, um, we're working with emergency management to figure out exactly how much foam we have so that we know exactly the, the extent of the problem we're working with. But it's going to be a big deal. And that's in a powder form, right? That we mix with water. Is it? No, it's a, it's like a liquid gel okay. and simply makes a whole bunch of bubble bath. This is what it looks like. Right. We've used it for years. Unfortunately, they're finding it very, very cancerous and um, uh, very, very toxic. Two things. Can you give, give the stuff we got back to whoever donated it to us, to the oil company or whoever Not that the, is, whoever. down the street on 86 and just leave it there and say thank you and uh, we didn't need it? Uh, no. There was a very, very narrow window three or four years ago where, as they were coming out with new foams that didn't have this in it, there was a narrow window where these companies would have taken back what you had in order to sell you the new stuff. Uh, but um, nobody knew enough then to have the, the funding or to find the funding uh, to take advantage of it. It's a big issue, and it's bigger than fire departments uh, times a hundred when it comes to the landfills because the DNR and the EPA are looking to regulate that as well with every PFOS coming into your facility. And it's a, it's a slippery slope to open that door legislatively um, when it comes to the EPA wants to regulate it, but they have no regulation, they have no enforcement mechanism, uh, and they have no solution to PFOS, right? So, on, on, as a city that owns a la two landfills and such, I, I would say caution because you open that door and it's going to be regulated under the landfills that, that has no solution. Uh, the EPA, the DNR, nobody has a solution for PFOS. Like you said, it's a forever chemical, forever plastic. Uh, it, well, the simple numbers are billions of dollars, even for the state of Iowa landfills, which would bankrupt every one of them if it had to be regulated. So it's a balancing act of, and, I, and we get it, I get it. I mean, it's a terrible chemical or terrible, terrible byproduct. But. Yeah. Do I hear then direction that this is one we wanna pause on or is this something that we're comfortable or re rewording? 
I think if you do it very narrowly for the fire departments of, a, of securing a way to store it, right? Um, makes sense. Does it take uh, legislation or is it working directly with the DNR? I know you said you're trying to get their attention. They're broke. Well, we're asking for funding. It was, it's yeah, a funding DN, focus. DNR is literally broke I because know. of the legislators, no, right? They and are. So I think it's forcing the legislators to give a funding pot to, this is where I say very narrowly, to the fire, you know, fire departments. It does open the door, though, for the landfill associations and the recycling associations to slip in and say, what about us? Um, yeah. How are you going to fund billions of dollars for PFOS going through the leachate and the water systems that we take? WRA is also looking at this as a major hurdle. Um, the good thing is it's on the radar. Another good thing is there is no solution, so the EPA can't enforce it. There's just there, you can't get rid of the material. Unless you can find some way, and this is also actively being researched now, to cost effectively break them up. To do what? To break them apart. To break apart those, to unwind those chemicals. To oh, right. Molecularly, molecular, yes. Yeah, and that hasn't been yeah, found yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to choke on my own tongue if I try and say that word again. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying stop it. I think that everyone needs to work together. This is a giant issue that yep. this is what we've heard because we've asked fire departments to put it into the landfill, which is lined and could handle it. But then we have a byproduct of water that we have to get rid of that we then take to WRA. Now it's their problem. Yep. You own WRA, it's your problem, right? Goes it, down the it river. Just and keeps it's going the next, to the yep. cities and yep. back to us. So it's a, just a, very it's it's the challenge because the, the state my concern is that the state doesn't figure out some kind of program for this you know we're obviously a big fire department what happens to the small the fire departments out in rural iowa who doesn't know what they have and just gets rid of it however they get rid of it or they know what they have and they get rid of it uh, yeah it that's the concern that's is if we don't have happens. an answer or at least a storage <laughs> answer at some point i'm worried about what may ultimately happen for our waterways. Yep. The last new one is item number uh, A under five. So the five is our historically been our catch all for anything related to home rule and the frequent incursions on home rule. But the one that we are hearing is likely to come again from the, the governor's office and from the caucuses, the leadership caucuses is related to a state building code. And would that preempt then local building codes? This got headed off after quite a lot of debate at the committee level. I don't believe it ever made it as a uh, bill down to the floor for any kind of voting action, but I would expect that it's gonna come back at us in this coming legislative session. The concept of a statewide building code isn't by itself necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it could help us in some interesting ways. One that Doug has identified uh, is that in some of the ways that we're scored on our FEMA grant applications, we'd score better if Iowa had a statewide building code. The trouble comes if that state building code then preempts all other building codes, our building codes here in Clive. The standard that the state was proposing to establish last year would have been multiple generations behind this building codes that we have adopted here in Clive, that all of you have adopted here in Clive. We think that's an overreach. We think that those decisions are best made here at the local level and consistent and, and consistent with the principle of home rule. We don't know the final shape that it's going to take, but we want to make sure that even if they do establish a statewide code in general, it's not going to prevent us from going where you all deem it's appropriate for Clive to be at when it comes to safe building codes, building good neighborhoods and good housing. I guess my reaction is I'm really, really nervous about a statement that telling the legislature to adopt a state building code. I mean, I guess I would think in terms of if the state adopts a building code, that code should not preempt. I don't know what others think. I mean, that's man. Good. I, I like that too. Okay. We'll and make just this more flexible. building code in our list of number yeah. five. 
make decisions at local levels, such as fireworks control, building codes, right? You could add it to that list and not necessarily have the adopt focus, but it's the don't preempt our building codes kind of focus. Yeah, I'm yeah, that's an idea. Others. Fireworks. I do have a few things. Susan. So I have a couple of specific things, but I'd like to look at kind of an overarching question. And I realize this is a document primarily to guide discussion with our four legislators. And it's good to have things that we highlight there that are important to Clive. But I was looking at what we have compared to what the Iowa League of Cities is doing. And they list what they call legislative values that are just kind of basics. And I think it could be worthwhile to reiterate that at the beginning and say, we're in agreement with what the Iowa League of Cities says about local control, financial stability, economic development, infrastructure, and public safety. And a lot of what they're talking about here is built in to what we're asking for. So maybe if we could do that and then call out some of the specifics that we wanted to ask for, like here's where we are on I will, or here's where we are on a state building code, it might get a little bit more attention and be something that our legislators could run with a little bit more easily and understand we're in tandem with cities as a whole on some of it. Just a question, yeah. but I think it's worth taking a look at it. And then just a couple of specifics under number one, it's MFPRSI, which is uh, Municipal Fire and Police Retirement System of Iowa. So just correcting that um, acronym would be good. And then I think maybe we've referred to impact fees here before, but I would really just like to suggest taking that out. I don't think it's worthwhile to ask for a study of it. There are plenty of other states that have it, so we could show them here's what the benefits are without their having to do a study. And um, which one was that? That one is... Two, two. Yeah, where it says research opportunities to utilize impact fees for development costs. Even back when I was lobbying on behalf of the League of Cities, this was a big issue because of a court decision that basically said we can't collect any impact fees in the state unless the legislature writes into the code that we can. So we're basically asking them to study doing that, but there was no way that they wanted to look at doing that. And I just can't even imagine that they want to go and write in a new tax because that's what the legislature called it. They said it's a tax. And I'm sorry, it's what the courts called it was a tax. And I, I just don't see that going anywhere. <laughs> So would you just want to get rid of the second sentence? Yeah, I, I don't think we need to ask them to research it. We can show them the, the pros and cons if we want them to look at that. But it's, it's I, I guess I don't really care, but I, I'd like to be asking for things that we know they're looking to do and might hurt us and got, provide some guidance or help us and provide some guidance. And otherwise, things we really want and expect could get some attention and should, maybe in collaboration with other cities. That's why I wanted to see what the league was saying, because yeah. I think we get further. So part of this document is as kind of concise as it is, because we try and keep it real direct for the time we have with the legislators when we meet with them before yeah. the meetings. So referencing that we partner well with the League of Cities is something that frequently comes up in our discussions with those legislators. Uh, we can add some language to it. I would guide, I would uh, recommend that the council still keep this pretty concise. I'd pre, like it was last year, I'd really like to just put it on one side of a piece of paper. Yeah. So people I think can you take can it. just show those values, which are really short. I mean, it's 
this is it. Yeah, I'm right here. With those. So there's almost nothing to it. Then we end up with about five bullets that we're asking for that don't already correlate. It, it shortens ours down a lot. Because a lot of what we have built in there says the same thing that they do. Yep. You can see how those things can be meshed together. Any other changes? All right. We'll, break, we'll work up a new draft and then bring it for consideration at the December meeting. And Pete, what's our timetable for meeting with the legislators? We typically meet with them in December or very first part of January before the session. Yeah, we'll see. That'll be a meeting. Typically, it's a meeting, Mayor, that we do at you and me. And occasionally the Mayor Pro Tem. And occasionally the Mayor Pro Tem. Mm -hmm. Available. It'll be available. Well, maybe this would be a good segue to uh, last night's meeting of my log, which is a Metro Mayor's. We did meet with uh, Metro uh, legislators, and many of the items that uh, are listed here were mentioned by other mayors in the in the Metro. So they have similar concerns to what uh, to what we have, and our Mayor Pro Tem was there as well. I don't know if you want to elaborate on some of the things that you heard. But that was that was that they were near most of these, and so that helps a lot. Um, you know, fireworks was a major discussion last night. What was interesting is the legislators had an, two, uh, two or three opportunities to, uh, to spell out what they were going to be pushing, and not one of them spoke uh, on it. But it was well attended yeah. by uh, state senators and reps. So, Good. yeah. Good. Our uh, delegation is set. Elections were clear, and uh, we'll be reaching out to all the candidates who won, who ran, thanking them for taking a crack at it, and certainly the ones who won, and getting those meetings scheduled for the December January timeframe. Very good. Thank Very good. You. Thank you, Matthew. We can take my can take that down. Next on the agenda, we have reports. Pete. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who made it in for pictures tonight. Chris Meharry did a nice job. I hope you all had some fun. We're going to get the draft pictures tomorrow. And he'll be touching those up as well, cropping, getting everything looking good and consistent. And once we've got stuff that you're all happy with, we'll replace your existing headshots on the website, replace them with these new ones so we've got some consistency. And probably add that you know, one of the best group shots up there as well and add one to the wall. We'll so have weavers in a week or two. <laughs> Couple more. <laughs> I already mentioned moving the date for the Northwest Neighborhoods meeting. That one is really important to get set. So we'll stay close to all of you as we kind of work on dates. Is that one where you want some council representation there or you prefer not? Because it's sometimes we have them where you want some of us there and sometimes not. So. I always welcome that. Um, I mean, we're putting a lot of resources to bringing your constituents together. If, if you want to get a touch with your constituents, obviously I, we're not going to stand in the way, but so it's your discretion on how you'd like to participate there, but it's going to be a well-attended meeting. The uh, filming that we got done today, thank you, Councilman McLeanady, thank you, Councilman Weaver, for some time as we got that filming done. Sorry, uh, Councilman Klein, we weren't able to get you fit in this afternoon, but if you haven't sent me your availability to sit down for just 15, 20 minutes in the library to get that filming done, it's not going to take but just a second. That way I can start putting this all together so I can start working on that project. Finally, the Lions Basket Program is on to its, I, want to say, I think it's 30th year now. It's a significant anniversary year. Uh, I don't remember the exact year. I do know, though, that we're going to try and get to 85 families this year and that the date when we'll be going out to deliver the baskets will be on 12-10, meeting at the church at 9 o'clock. Between now and then, you can pick up some items that for uh, uh, from the gift trees, either at Lifetime, the library, or at Mercy Health and Wellness. Anything else? No, sir. Just recap. Uh, no update other than uh, you do have to tell Pete which side is your good side when you do the videos. So. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Good. All right. Uh, water trails. Hopefully everyone saw the announcement. Um, the Scott Avenue phase 
Um, we did get a bid back. So the Scott Avenue phase is the in, in water recreational component with the dam mitigation. Um, the engineer's estimate for that uh, phase was 43 million. It came in at 40.9. So worked out great. That was just passed at the MPO uh, exec uh, yesterday. Or, yeah, yesterday. Um, and so that is moving forward. And so we had that November 1st uh, letting and um, we were, you know, kind of on pins and needles for that, but uh, came back good. So it's moving forward. Um, Anything else at the MPO? <laughs> So MPO, um, I, I mentioned this previously, um, that we had a spirited uh, debate about the role of the MPO in, in kind of the metro and some what some would consider scope creep of the MPO's role. Um, we had been brought forth a, a contract from Story County Housing Trust to for the MPO to um, manage the contract basically um, and kind of be the back office if you will for for this this trust um, organization um, <clears throat> so some of us had some objections to that because um, housing is not really the primary function of the MPO and beyond that uh, the um, story county is not in the MPO's jurisdiction so we were supporting um, you know, an area that's not even part of the MPO. And um, lots of good arguments and reasons for why to support it. Um, but there were, um, there, there was a lot of debate about uh, whether we, we should or not. That still has not been resolved. Um, uh, just so you know, I voted against it um, uh, for the short term until we have our strategic planning. So we're gonna be having a strategic, strategic planning session uh, in uh, mid-December um, to kind of flesh out here is the specific uh, function and mission of the MPO. And if that, if at that meeting the full MPO decides that this should be part of our mission, then I will support it. But uh, I did not uh, support it at this point because it, it's additional office space, it's additional employees. Um, there, these things always tend to grow organically. And so um, you know, my concern is with some scope creep and, and, and its impact into the, the operations of the MPO itself and um, distracting it from transportation. And so, um, so that was, that was kind of my, my feedback to the group um, along with a few others as well. So we'll see what happens in strategic planning. Like I said, that's gonna be in about a month um, and uh, we'll see how it moves forward. But there was definitely some, some strong opinions about it. Is the intention for revenue, uh, additional revenue? Yeah, that's part of it. It's, it's kind of, uh, you know, um, diversifying revenue. Um, and, and that's fine. And that that's definitely a good argument for it, right? Um, and, and, and part of the argument is, is it, it's not going to have any impact on the MPO or its operations. And um, I'm not satisfied that that's, not, it may be true at the front end, but again, these things always tend to grow over time. And so, um, I, I just, I would need to see some more guardrails around that personally, so. Anything else to add? That's it. For questions. I do have a, yeah. at least a qu quick one. Sure. Um, I know in the past, a few members of the MPO board have not really liked it, that the MPO was involved in some of the water discussions for watershed management authorities. Right. And I think that is very appropriately connected to transportation. We've had problems with the DOT saying, we don't worry about water and that's to the detriment of some of their transportation projects, quite mm -hmm. honestly. So I just kind of want to say, I hope you'll, um, when you go through strategic planning, be supportive of their continued, rather limited, but effective mm -hmm. work in the watershed related okay. arena that have been very helpful. They're helping to support the Polk County Council of Watershed Management Authorities. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been well, but, good. And I hear you, Susan, I'll definitely take that, uh, you know, into account. Um, but as you, if, if you keep growing that into other areas, you know, watershed, housing, you know, you get into other things, where does that, 
where does that get reined in, right? And 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 how does that impact our mission on transportation? Yeah, so, I'm not disagreeing. I just kind of wanted yeah. to put in a no, I appreciate plus because yeah. I've seen the value, right. but I know that's been, you know, Tom Hawkins Smith and yeah, Tom is very much against like it. That. Yeah, he's very much against it, yeah. and he's very um, vocal about, yeah. about that. Yeah, so. thank you. Yeah, I know. He has an opinion. Yeah, I know. It's surprising. <laughs> Ooh. So anything else for Ted? Otherwise, we might have a video presentation. We do. First, I just want to, I'm not going to go through every, for Catch Des Moines, everything they brought in here. But I did find interesting that when we've talked about out-of-the-box thinking. And one of the things that, that we did was we brought in uh, six uh, uh, influencers on social, social media based upon how big their following was on LinkedIn, Instagram, and other platforms. They spent a couple of days in, in Des Moines, uh, some that scheduled and some of their own, but uh, they're gonna looking forward to having some ongoing communication to see, have them talking about Des Moines and you know about some of the uh, experiences that, that they've had to continue to, to build up our great city. I did wanna show a, off a quick video here. I thought you guys might enjoy this. This was put out, thought I just wanted to share. Do I have a nice code? Oh, yes, it is. Okay. Hit it, Pete. Hit it. Fun in Des Moines. Some people might think we like to bide our time watching the corn grow and milking cows. Well, these certainly are compelling options, and we really can show you how to milk a cow. Sometimes our idea of fun is decidedly less corny. Here in Des Moines, we are voted America's number one minor league market, and for good reason. We have our own brand of lovable cubs where you can catch a rising star, and if you're lucky, a hot dog. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Go Cubs. If you're the outdoorsy type, you'll enjoy our over 800 miles of biking trails, including the iconic 25 mile high trestle trail seen on Instagram accounts everywhere. Right. Sorry. And you'd kind of expect us to have one of the best farmers markets in the country, and you'd be right. And you can ask 25,000 of my closest friends. And if the indoors are more your thing, we have outlet malls, lifestyle malls, cool neighborhood boutiques, unique shopping districts, and even the self-proclaimed greatest store in the universe. If you want to rock and roll all night and party at least part of the day, we have everything from the symphony and world-class opera to indie bands, arena rock, and country, along with two of the hippest music fests in the Midwest. And of course, we have the ubiquitous Brazilian Twins. They won't stop following me around! Whoever thinks Des Moines is boring has clearly never polished off a corn dog, some mini donuts, and a couple of craft beers, and then ridden the monster. They might regret that. It's time. Whether your thrills are the OMG, I can't believe I found this dress on sale variety, or the OMG, I can't believe I let my kids talk me into this ride kind, here in Des Moines, we have something for everyone. Isn't that right? Des Moines, the yeses are silent, our attractions scream. Whee! <laughs> Where is that? Yeah, what is that? I wondered that too. <laughs> and I just want to share that with you guys. We continue to come up with creative ideas and continue to, to market our great region. Thank you, Eric. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, one, I think I sent a note around. We're looking at the mayoral appointments for 2023. If you have an interest in making any changes, let me know so we can take those into account. Secondly, tomorrow is Veterans Day. I wanted to remind everyone of that and to thank our veterans that are here tonight uh, for, their, for their service. We appreciate that. Uh, hope you'll also recognize others tomorrow as well. In follow-up to the presentation we had from the Horizon Center, I did pass on to the Clive Community Foundation that there was openness to having conversation about um, some community support. And Bob Forte met with them. They are interested in doing some communication. I've tried to keep the city manager and mayor in the loop as I've known anything because I didn't want to step on anything else the city might want to do. but be aware that there seems to be some interest in working together on that. 
um, as our appointee to the Homeless Coordinating Council and vice chair of that, there's been some ongoing interest in how to handle extreme weather issues. And um, that's kind of a special time when there may be need for extra support. So I've also been part of a subcommittee looking at extreme weather issues. And with temperatures about to start to dive here, that will be discussed again. As you know, the houselessness, which is, tends to be a term that's used more now instead of homeless, um, has been increasing and there's been more concern about seeing more people without um, support. We continue to look at coordinating with all the shelters and I think I've reported before that there was a study to identify why um, when there is some space in shelters, people aren't taking advantage of it. And there are multiple reasons for that, but it continues to be a struggle. And the city of Des Moines is now um, looking at hiring a coordinator to deal with um, the issue. So I think that'll be worth watching. Um, I attended the Capitol Crossroads Big Sort. I don't know if anybody else went through that, but okay. That was fascinating to see the trends that are expected over the next couple of decades. And um, then a couple of watershed related <coughs> meetings, so. Very good. Michael. Do not have anything tonight, sir. Just a couple quick things, Your Honor. Um, We'll have a, a table at Bravo again this year. I know I've talked with those of you who have attended in the past uh, to get that uh, table compliment. Uh, get a registration done here uh, probably tomorrow for that to make sure we kind of hit the city table deadline. And then we'll also anticipate all of you um, attending at the uh, partnership dinner. So we'll get that table uh, secured since we're going to be moving the council meeting to accommodate that on January 26th. Um, also wanted to make you aware, I know I've been mentioning it in my weekly update, but the, on the 22nd of this month will be the first public information meeting on the Hickman Interchange that the DOT is hosting. Um, I know uh, uh, Councilmember Jedkins uh, is already uh, attending, uh, potentially Mayor Edwards as well. And um, we'll have some staff there too. Um, that'll be uh, from five to 6.30 at the Walnut Hills Methodist Church there up on the, kind of up on the they hill. They do that on purpose because it's Thanksgiving week and they figure oh. the numbers would be lower? It, they went, uh, as, as somebody who was in those meetings where they were trying to figure out a date, it, it, they went back and forth on a bunch of different dates. <laughs> and uh, from the city perspectives, we were like, just don't do it on a council meeting night uh, for Urbandale or Clive is basically what we told them. <laughs> Um, so we could, if we, and again, this is this the initial public information meeting. But you already have seen a lot of what will be shown uh, at the Tuesday. It's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. I, uh, I meant to mention, uh, and this would be a perfect time for it, that I did hear last night from Mark Holm that he has put himself on the lead for the land acquisition of our yep. interchange. Really? Mm. So yeah, he's on the right, he's on the right away team. Person and lead here at least i think you have a friendly mm -hmm. person that is he's on executive you don't know his day job yeah and we're actually going to be uh, chatting with him because there's uh and we talked about a little bit when it was presented there's that trail component alongside the the loves ditch um where we want to connect the trail from hickman down to the green belt but the dot won't secure that right away for us because it's for a trail and not related to the interstate but we want to try to work with the DOT on, is there a gap there? Do we butt it up against their right away? And how do we strategically work with loves together on that? Um, and so that's something from a staff side that we're going to be connecting with Mark on and I do, making I sure we're putting ourselves in a good position. He's a big biker. He's a big trail right. guy. He's... Right. And that'll be out of the city's dime to do for that acquisition. Uh, the rest will be the DOT. Um, acquiring what they need for right away. This this was the only piece that was kind of outside of the right away that we had to take a look at. So more to come on that. Um, and also a week from tonight, uh, just a reminder too, uh, for those of you who remember back in two, uh, December 2019, when we had the, the hit and run case by Indian Hills uh, School with Nicole Poole and, uh, and then the victim, Natalie Miranda. 
a week from tonight is the TV show on a &E at 9 p.m. Um, called Interrogation Raw. Did I get that right? Where it's actually going to be featured. What um, channel is it? A&E? &E. &E. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's a week from tonight. I, and I have the reminder in there in my weekly update if you want to watch that or, or record it. Um, take a look at that. So kind of something different where Clive is featured in an unfortunate case, but one that was, was chief in that. Was he interviewed for that? Yes. A uh, number of us were. Yeah. So probably edit me out. So. <laughs> no. so anyway, Get down on the glare. That's all I have, Your Honor. Unless there's any questions. Yeah. 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 Any correspondence, Matthew? Anything else for the good of the order this evening? Hearing none, we'll adjourn at 759.